Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. A few weeks ago, this video was released relative to helium. Subsequently, this comment was posted. At what temperature will the sun cease to support the corona, causing the coronal material to fall back into the sun and detonate? Asking for a friend. A reply was posted trivializing the question stating, why would the temperature change anytime soon and why would plasma detonate? Is your friend 12 years old? But for those who actually understand the standard solar model and the implications of a lower coronal temperature than currently accepted, the question was right on target. So today I have decided to take the time to answer. Of course, the question assumes that the sun is a gaseous plasma because it is only in the standard solar model that the need to support the corona using temperature is even necessary. In the standard model, if the temperature of the solar corona is not at millions of degrees as currently assumed, then the corona would collapse. As a matter of fact, in the standard solar model, elevated temperatures are also utilized not only to support the corona, but to help drive the solar wind. Along these lines, Eugene Parker advanced that thermal expansion of the corona drives the acceleration of the solar wind. Steve Crothers and I have disputed this argument in this paper and as presented in detail in this video. Unfortunately, the equation advanced by Parker contains temperatures which are both intensive and non-intensive at the same time, a clear violation of the laws of thermodynamics. Temperature must always be intensive. I will not repeat the arguments outlining Parker's errors in this video and anyone who is interested can consult the previous presentation. In the end, the key point is that the solar wind is not being accelerated using thermal expansion because the corona is not at millions of degrees. Solar physicists have ignored chemistry and that is why they are coming up with unreasonable temperatures both in the corona and in solar flares. For instance, here is what NASA writes. Solar flares extend out to the layer of the sun called the corona. The corona is the outermost atmosphere of the sun consisting of a highly rarefied gas. This gas normally has a temperature of a few million degrees Kelvin. Inside a flare, the temperature typically reaches 10 or 20 million degrees Kelvin and can be as high as 100 million degrees Kelvin. Similar temperatures have been advanced by Priest in this paper and Harold Zirin has highlighted the temperatures as elevated as 10 to the 10th or 10 billion Kelvin have been detected in the corona by observing using the radio band. Clearly such temperatures are unreasonable and result from improperly assigning temperatures to processes which are not governed by random physical events. Harold Zirin has issued a warning in this regard, but it has been largely ignored by the solar physicist. We must admit, however, that the ionization theory not only gives the wrong temperature, but fails to account for many stages of ionization observed in the corona. It is possible that temperature variations explain that fact. We can only wait for better observations of the line profiles of intermediate ions to confirm the existence of temperature differences. The next sentence is key. It is more likely that there is something erroneous in our basic concept of how ionization takes place, but so far we do not know what this is. What Zirin was unknowingly looking for was chemistry. This is what the solar physicists with their ideas of random temperature ionizations have missed. The unrealistic temperatures they claim should have prompted further inquiry, but no one except Zirin expressed any doubt. The examples I gave in these two videos relative to the chemical selection of triplet lines in helium versus the singlet lines are sufficient to prove that we are not dealing with random processes in the atmosphere of the sun. What we observe is not governed by temperature, but by chemistry. Clearly, the elevated temperatures invoked by the proponents of the standard solar model in the corona have consequences, yet things are not as clean as solar physicists portray. We have already seen that Parker's account for the acceleration of solar winds as a result of thermal expansion cannot be correct, as it violates the intensive nature of temperature. Then Zirin warns us that temperature ionization might be erroneous. 
But what is even stranger is that in order to account for the white light of the K corona, solar physicists make use of relativistic electrons which must be scattering photospheric light. If one believes the temperature of the corona is at millions of Kelvin, then clearly the corona must not be producing a continuous spectrum in the optical range. In the standard solar model, the K corona cannot be self-luminous. So to get around the problem, solar physicists invoke that the K corona simply represents photospheric light which has been scattered by relativistic electrons. That is why the continuous coronal spectrum is largely devoid of Fraunhofer lines. Yet if relativistic electrons are able to explain the lack of Fraunhofer lines in the K corona through scattering, how can we possibly observe the Fraunhofer spectrum on Earth? Clearly these two observations are diametrically opposed to one another if relativistic scattering would actually be real. So not only does the standard model require coronal temperatures in the millions of Kelvin, but now relativistic electrons are required to account for the appearance of the K corona. In the end, for solar physics, the K corona is just scattered light. But for anyone willing to think about these issues, a few more problems arise. The continuous spectrum of the K corona simply does not represent scattered light. This region must in fact be self-luminous. It is well known that the solar corona is anchored to the photosphere. When the sun is quiet, coronal holes are viewed as anchored onto the polar regions, as one can learn in this paper. I stated previously that this anchoring constitutes a powerful sign that the sun is comprised of condensed matter, since this behavior directly implies both long-term structure within the corona and the existence of a true solar surface. Anchoring requires two regions of the sun to cooperate with one another in order to produce structural restriction. Along these lines, it has been stated that the corona possesses a radially rigid rotation of 27.5 days synodic period from 2.5 r to greater than 15 r, as established by the solar satellite. Rigid rotation of the entire corona strongly supports the idea that the solar body and the corona possess condensed matter. Furthermore, coronal material contains magnetic field lines which are anchored within the solar body at the level of the photosphere, again requiring the presence of condensed matter. Note that unlike the corona of the sun, the atmosphere of the earth is not anchored to its surface, as can be readily observed by anyone laying on the grass and looking up at the moving clouds. Now just imagine what would be required to anchor the atmosphere of the earth. Could that ever be accomplished if there was no condensed matter involved? Even more troubling for those who believe that the continuous spectrum of the K corona is simply a manifestation of scattered photospheric light is the fact that coronal seismology exists as one can learn in these papers. The existence of such seismology provides direct support for the presence of condensed matter in a corona which is self-luminous. Coronal seismology is inconsistent with the idea that the K corona simply represents scattered photospheric light. After all, all relativistic electrons are not going to be able to participate in seismological activity, as the associated velocities would be much too low. Secondly, it has been known for nearly 80 years that the K corona reddens with increasing distance from the solar surface, and this directly implies that the self-luminous corona is cooling with elevation. Here is a quote from 1946. Microphotograms for solar distances varying from r equal 1.2s to r equal 2.6s show that the coronal radiation reddens slightly as the distance from the sun is increased. Here is another, more recent quotation relative to the reddening of the K corona. Reddening increases with height due to the increase of the contribution of the F corona. Of course, this is saying nothing, since the F corona is likely simply to be the K corona, which has sufficiently cooled to reflect photospheric light, as I first suggested in this paper. That is why Fraunhofer lines are now seen in the F corona. In fact, the observation that Fraunhofer lines can be seen in the F corona exposes the errors in logic with the standard solar model relative to the K corona. If relativistic electrons at the level of the K corona can scatter the photospheric light and eliminate most of the Fraunhofer lines, then how could these same lines still be present in the more distant F corona? 
Or once again, how could we observe the Fraunhofer spectrum here on Earth? Clearly, the corona is cooling with elevation. It is not at millions of Kelvin, as Zirin suspected long ago. Another line of evidence that the solar atmosphere is cooling with elevation was discovered when monitoring carbon monoxide absorption in the chromosphere, as we saw in this video. The carbon monoxide absorption indicates cooling with elevation, not heating. In the last video, I provided this series of images obtained in helium. Given these images, it is clear that the corona is not at millions of Kelvin, as currently claimed by the standard solar model. In fact, if the corona was truly at millions of Kelvin, one would never be able to obtain helium images from this region of the Sun, as the element would be fully ionized at temperatures well below 1 million Kelvin. In support of this argument, I provided this link to an astronomy website wherein the Saha equation was utilized to predict that helium would be fully ionized at only 40,000 Kelvin. If one uses a simple plasma physics argument, dispenses with the Saha equation, and recognizes that helium has a second ionization energy of 54.4 electron volts, then complete ionization would occur at 630,000 Kelvin, well below accepted temperatures of the corona. So enough already, the corona is not at millions of Kelvin. To further demonstrate the prevalence of unreasonable temperatures, it is well known that solar physicists claim temperatures of 10 to 20 million Kelvin within X-class solar flares, as one can learn in this paper. However, clear emission lines from helium-2 can be observed within such flares as discussed by Zirin in this paper, and such emissions lead to much lower temperatures. Obviously, we are not witnessing temperatures in the dozens of millions of Kelvin within solar flares. The interpretations of solar physicists relative to temperatures within X-class solar flares are clearly incorrect, and this once again manifests a refusal to think about chemistry. Now back to our question. In the context of the gaseous model, the corona possesses no condensed matter. It is gaseous plasma which is supported by elevated temperatures given rise to gas pressure. It is also supported presumably by magnetic field lines. The same ideas are used in the standard solar model to account for the support of the chromosphere as I have previously addressed in this paper. Yet one cannot generate gas pressure without a surface, as long recognized throughout physics and chemistry, and as I have highlighted many times on this channel. The derivation of the ideal gas law wherein gas pressure was first studied depends on an enclosure. Still, the astronomers believe that they can have recourse to the law in treating their gaseous sun without any rigid confinement. This is a violation both of elementary physics and chemistry. Secondly, the measurement or generation of pressure depends on the presence of a real surface, not an imaginary one. The relevant equation in physics for pressure involves force over surface area. The pressure occurs because of a change in particle momentum when striking the surface of interest. As a result, the area cannot be hypothetical. Consequently, it is not reasonable for proponents of the standard solar model to invoke gas pressure, whether within the solar interior in order to build hydrostatic equilibrium in combination with radiation pressure and gravity, or at the level of the photosphere in order to hold up the chromosphere and the corona. Gas pressure does not exist to support the chromosphere and corona in the standard solar model precisely because the photosphere in that case is nothing but an illusion. It is not a real surface. I suggest that before anyone worries about the collapse of the corona due to insufficient temperature, they should worry about needing a real surface to generate the needed gas pressure in the first place. In addition to gas pressure, one can have recourse to magnetic fields, but again, these fields are anchored and that requires condensed matter. So in the end, to answer the question, in the metallic hydrogen solar model, the corona can be supported simply because it is not comprised solely of gaseous plasma, but also contains condensed matter. This condensed matter is anchored by magnetic fields, which are in turn anchored to the solar photosphere. Now how about the solar winds? Clearly, thermal expansion is not the answer. My son Christoph and I in this paper have argued that the fast solar winds arise as a result of exclusionary forces on the atoms contained in intercalate zones of the Sun. But what about the slow solar wind? And what about its acceleration? 
I believe that the best answer lies once again in the recognition that condensed matter exists in the corona. This is evidenced by streamers, which are clearly real structures extending out to many solar radii. So now we have condensed matter and we need to think about what processes can be involved. The first processes which come to mind are simply vaporization and sublimation. Consider this simple phase diagram. When an object sublimes, it moves directly from the solid to the gas phase. When it vaporizes, it moves directly to the gas phase, but now from the liquid phase. In both cases, the transitions occur below the boiling point and they are the result of lowered pressure. Now how does this apply to the sun? I have already stated that a real lattice exists in the metallic hydrogen solar model. The material is produced within the sun where temperatures and pressures are elevated. These are the two critical parameters in synthesizing metallic hydrogen as I have previously covered in these videos. At the core of the sun, the structure should be a body-centered cubic as first proposed by Setsuo Ishimaru. But in the convection zone, it makes more sense that the structure of the lattice changes to hexagonal planar. In synthesizing metallic hydrogen, pressure acts to lower the band gap separating the valence shell and the conduction band, while elevated temperatures facilitate the entry of valence electrons into the conduction band. As a result, the interior of the sun is perfectly suited to make fully metallic hydrogen, which again is most reasonably a body-centered cubic at the core, but becomes hexagonal type 2 in the convection zone just below the photosphere. When this metallic hydrogen moves to the surface of the sun, the pressure becomes lower, and the metallic hydrogen lattice relaxes somewhat, as predicted by theory. Thus, on the surface, we have a second form of metallic hydrogen, wherein the internuclear distance is slightly greater. In my papers, I refer to this form of metallic hydrogen as type 1. It remains hexagonal planar, but is now semi-metallic in nature, just like graphite. This material is thought to be metastable, and these details have previously been presented in these papers. Synthesized in the interior of the sun, metallic hydrogen can still exist on the surface at lower pressure. I have proposed that the condensed matter which can be found in the corona is actually photospheric in nature. It has been propelled into the corona by solar activity. Here, it remains somewhat stable and self-luminous, but becomes increasingly subject to slow vaporization and or sublimation, because now both the temperature and pressure are dropping. The drop in pressure raises the level of the conduction band as the band gap increases, and the lowered temperature permits electrons to jump back down into the valence shell. Consequently, the material begins to sublime or vaporize as metastability slowly becomes compromised. If you think about it a little, you will come to recognize that these processes will result in a net outward force on the solar wind. This is because any atom which sublimes or vaporizes off and initially moves towards the solar photosphere will eventually be redirected upwards, since the sun has a real surface. Hence, the slow breakdown of metallic hydrogen in the self-luminous corona results in a net force away from the sun. Herein, we have a simple explanation for the origin and acceleration of the slow solar wind without the need for thermal expansion. In the end, expansion does occur, yet the cause is not temperature, but the slow breakdown of coronal metallic hydrogen. So there you go. The corona in the liquid metallic hydrogen solar model will not collapse just because temperatures are lower than currently accepted. Rather, the corona is being supported through its condensed nature and by the fact that magnetic fields are anchored at its base. This serves to emphasize once again the elegance and the simplicity of the sun as outlined by the liquid metallic hydrogen solar model. Its ease of explaining coronal extent and the origins of the solar wind and its acceleration is infinitely superior to anything the standard model has to offer. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on the next video.